first uh, session scholarship jump fair 2019. Uh, my name is Mary Robinson and I'm uh, on the um, committee of AGTA. And AGTA work with the um, School of Environment at the University of Auckland, which is coordinated by Mel, who's going to be talking to you a bit later on in the day. So we're going to run this session in three parts. Um, for some of you, what I'm going to talk about might be a little bit of repetition, um, but uh, because you might have already started doing some work on scholarship, but for some of you this is your first kind of introduction to geography scholarship. So I'm going to do a little introduction about what geography scholarship is, the kinds of things you need to be able to do to be a good geographer in a scholarship exam, and then Mel is going to um, give you a lecture, which you have some notes for, and that is the sheet that's got um, some blue printed in colour. Okay? So the other sheet that you should have is another one like this. For those of you who have just arrived, we've run out, so these will be available, I'm sure, on the AGTA website, perhaps in the next little while. If you can, if you're close by and you have one, that you're happy to share with those people who've just arrived, that would be grand. Um, so, and we'll do some work with that. Um, teachers, I don't think I gave you one of those, so I think they will be on the website for you a little later. So what I thought I'd just talk to you a little bit about is a bit about Scholarship Geography 2019 and kind of what's expected of you. Because being a, um, a Scholarship Geography a student, you need to have some certain skills. And, oh, why did I not know how to do this? No, 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 no. Okay. So I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about the kind of attributes, the dispositions that you need to be a geography scholarship student and a candidate that achieves success. So I guess the first thing you need to be able to do is you need to have some good geographical knowledge. So you need to be reading widely about anything and everything you can think of about geography. That means it's not just whatever you're doing in your level three geo class, or your IB geo class, or your Cambridge class. It's reading really widely about what's actually happening across the globe. So that's the first thing you need to be. The second thing you need to be is you need to be a good reader and you need to be able to read fast. And if that's a thing for you to practice, that's what you need to be able to do. You need to be able to read fast and read for meaning and read for understanding about material. So my suggestion would be to read, read widely, be able to pick out the key ideas of things that you read in the news, the geography things. Associated with that, you need to have good writing skills. So you need to be able to communicate clearly and well so the examiner knows what you're talking about. You don't want the examiner, the person marking your exam, to be trying to work out what you are saying. So it means, firstly, literacy in terms of A, can they read the work you're doing? So we've just had exams at my school and I had one student I couldn't read her work at all, so I just gave her a fatty. Okay? But if I can't, if the marker can't read it, you won't get any marks. So that's first thing. Second thing is you've got to be able to write a sensible, structured essay that makes sense about the question. The third thing that you need to be is that you need to be analytical. You need to have some good skills that get you thinking about the issue and you need to be able to reflect and also um, kind of critically think about things. To be able to think about a resource that you might read and think is this a reliable, sensible resource. And I guess the last thing you need is to be a good time manager because the exam is um, one in which you have to be able to write quickly, efficiently, and you have to do all of the tasks to get a scholarship essentially. 
Okay, so here's the things you kind of need. I always like this picture, and some of the teachers have seen this um, vision before, is I think you need to be a confident person. You need to go into the exam thinking, hey, I can do this. You need to have a kind of a feel for geography. And that means you, you really kind of get it when your geography teacher makes a joke in class about geography. You're sitting there going, I don't know what she's talking about or what he's talking about. Um, you might struggle a bit with this. You need to understand those geographic concepts because unlike in level three, where you get the list of skills, you're not going to have that happen in geography scholarship. So you need to really understand them in a deep and meaningful way. You also need to be able to apply your knowledge from one setting to another. So for example, if, you looked at, if you've looked at tourism development in Rotorua, you might be able to take those ideas that you learnt from that topic and to apply it to a situation, say in Venice, and see that there are some contrasting ideas, some things that are similar, some things that are different. So be able to take your knowledge from one to another. Okay, so here's the things to why you should sit the exam. I think probably one of the main reasons to sit this exam is because it is a real challenge, it's quite a hard thing, and it's a real success when you've finished it. Irrespective of whether you get a scholarship in geography or not, it's actually a real challenge to be able to sit and think, hey, I can do this, okay? And of course, for some of you, this might be a motivation as well. So the exam itself. How many of you know about how the exam's done? Okay, zero. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're scared of me or not, but anyway. There are two parts to the exam. There is a resource booklet, and the resource booklet has about 20 pages of material around the topic that the exam is about. And this year the exam is about the significance of location. It includes graphs, maps, text, cartoons, poems, whatever the examiner kind of comes up with that's around the theme of location. And it might be around actual places, but it could be around um, some general ideas. And in addition, there are three questions of various sources that require answers, and they are essay questions. I'm just going to go back to the resource booklet. For those of you who are doing 3.4 skills, it's kind of the resource booklet looks a little bit like that. If you've done 2.4 in the past, it's a little bit like that. However, it's much more sophisticated. The language used in it is much more sophisticated than you would see in 3.4 or 2.4. Okay, one of the things you have to be able to do for the exam is to understand the meaning of the performance standard. And I've put a copy of that on this front page of this sheet here. So the performance standard is what do you have to do to get a scholarship in geography? So to get a scholarship in geography, it basically says the student will use knowledge of geography to critically analyze a geographic context. And there are two levels of scholarship. One is outstanding performance, and that's awarded to the top 2% of students across the whole cohort of students doing level three. That's around about 18, 19 students. No, it's not point two. Point two. 18 or 19 students across the whole of New Zealand. Okay, get an outstanding scholarship. They are students who can see things with insight, they write superbly well, they can reflect, look at things and predict what might happen in the future, and they can communicate superbly. Top 19, <coughs> maybe 20. Point two, I don't know why I said two percent. And then um, 3% of that cohort, around about 200 students across New Zealand, get a scholarship themselves, okay? And they are students who can analyze, critically analyze some stuff, 
they can integrate, synthesize, apply knowledge and things. And some of what we're doing here in these workshops will help you have a bit of an understanding around that. The second thing you need to know is about the assessment specifications. I've copied and pasted this off the website um, for you and I've written it in that um, grey colour on the page. How to approach scholarship geography. You need to be able to understand what we teachers call the command words or the instructional words and that's something I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later. You need to be able to plan your essays, how to use the three hours in exam time and then you need to be able to practice writing. Um, this is just really quick but basically these are marked quite differently from how they're marked in your NCA exams or your IB or your Cambridge exams, basically a super duper, super duper answer gets an eight or a seven out of eight, okay? And then a pretty good answer, someone who's probably likely to get a scholarship might get a five or a six out of eight. And someone who might just make the scholarship standard as a mark out of, might get a score out of four out of eight. And then underneath that, it's really important for you to know that the three questions you have to do all three, really. You can't possibly get those scores if you only do two of them. Okay, here are the things that the markers, the comments that the markers have said over time. You need geographic understanding. You should name continents and countries correctly. Nothing makes a geography teacher more cross than seeing a student write in the country of Africa. <coughs> Am I right, geo teachers? Yes. That really makes us cross. I'll actually have used some other word, but I didn't know. Um, names of continents, knowing where places are, it's really, it tells us a lot about the geography student we're marking if they say things kind of stupid like that. You need good geographic knowledge going beyond what is taught in class. So what you do in level three may not help you with this. It might, but you do need to go beyond it. You need to know how to write and plan an essay. And you need to be able to use the planning pages effectively. And my suggestion would be, if you haven't done this already, to pop onto the um, geographic, Geography Scholarship page on NZQA, have a look at some of the students who have been awarded scholarships in the past, and see how well they use their planning pages. In our next session, I'll do a little bit, someone will do a little bit about that, I think. Okay, here are two other things you need. You need resilience. Anyone tell me why you might need resilience for this? Yes? It's going to look overwhelming when you don't see the material. Absolutely. And if you're a good student, you're able to kind of go, oh yeah, and put that, think about it in another way, put it aside and deal with that overwhelmingness. Okay, nice work. And you need to persevere. It's no point going halfway through, I can't do this, and walking out. To be honest, you would have been better off to not walk in there in the first place. And that's me for the minute. Okay, I'm going to hand you over to Mel now, who's going to talk about, oh, you know, she's going to talk to you and then I'll come back. Tissues, I've got my um, 
water. As of yesterday, for the last 10 days, I had no voice. I've been resting it today and I'm hoping it's going to hold out. But at any stage, if you can't hear me within the room, please do let me know. Um, at the moment, can everyone hear me? Normally everyone could hear me in the room over, but um, I think I'm a bit limited today. I won't move around too much because the mic is just here. Just to the teachers in the room, and there are a number of you, um, a couple of things. We are actually recording this session. I know there's a camera on me. Hey, again. It's always good. I, I thought as I was wandering in it, how I got a bit out that I should have worn stripes, but that's enough about me. Um, within this, for the teachers, I will make, it's only an audio recording, but it's particularly for those that might also be outside of Auckland. If you would like to access this recording, please email me with an account that is attached to Gmail, and I will connect you to the university's um, uh, Google Drive, which actually has a whole lot of resources for this year and last year. So your teachers need to do this, not from the students, so please students don't, don't email me, but if your teachers could email me a Gmail account. So you just need to, um, and my details are on the handout, so please don't forget that. I will record not only uh, Mary's parts, unlike those available, just a heads up, I'll also have a file which is mine. Okay. So you're sitting here today, welcome to the University of Auckland. Show of hands, is this the first lecture you've been to before in a tertiary institution? Who's, and obviously teachers don't count, <laughs> who's been to one as a student? Anyone? So there's a few of you with some experience. Part of our job today is to kind of get you used to this environment. So who am I? So today we're talking, well I hope that this seems relevant to you guys, it's on location, it's the set topic. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how location can be understood within a global context. Who am I? I realised when I found my staff photo, it's a good 10 years old, so I probably need an updated model, um, so bear with me, it kind of looks the same. So here is my email for those who might want to contact me. Now what's my role? I am the Geography and Undergraduate Advisor, so if you would like a hand with your degree when you're planning, if you are intending to carry on into Geography, you can contact me. Please don't contact me to help you with your scholarship assignment. Um, go to your teacher first, I'll get a few of those, and I usually send them back to your teacher, okay? So that's probably the first person you should deal with. Now just picking up on a point that Mary made, and come on, that's all right. Um, why should you do scholarship? And I thought I'd say a little bit about why you should do that. If you come to the University of Auckland next year, you will be one of 42,000 students. Just at the moment, many of you will be sitting comfortably as some of the top students in your school, and I remember that feeling, that was a great feeling. You were on top of things. It was hard work, but you were noticed. One of the great things about scholarship is it gets you to have a little bit more, which actually gets you noticed. University, the great thing about it, it's not actually about what you know, it's being curious, it's being inspired. And actually, I'd strongly encourage you to reach for something more. Now, this has got absolutely nothing to do with geographers, but do you guys, uh, particularly the women in the audience, you know how women wear those, those cl that clothing, it's called stacks, that makes sticks in there, all the bits that bobbles. Well, the woman, the woman who started up the clothing stacks, she's a very well-known entrepreneur, and um, she said, someone she was asked once, what made her succeed? And she said her dad, used to ask her every day when she came home, what did you, what did you try and fail at? And she thought it was a little bit odd because she was a high achiever, but it meant she took some risks. I would strongly encourage you to go beyond just sitting, get, hitting those merits, okay? Can you expand your horizons? Now I can talk forever, so I better hurry on in this. So let's talk about the topic at hand. I won't talk about this, but I realise when I put the lecture together, some of you may need a roadmap through how I imagine the logic of my lecture. So go back to the slide if you get a little bit lost. This is the structure of what I'm going to talk about. So when you come into the university, the, the, the length of a, a lecture is 50 minutes, and you will usually sit there for that length of time, and it can be quite a daunting task for many students. I'm the first year lecturer for human geography for both of the courses, there's a team of us. And so I usually have anywhere between 200 and 300 students. So this is a normal class for us. Um, some of your bigger classes can get up to 1,500 students. 
Stats 101 has 3,000 this year. So just to give you a sense of just how large they are. So teachers, when you're complaining about your marking, I've got 300 on my desk. Just putting it into perspective. Right, so what is location? So location is actually in some ways quite a simple term. Just popularly defined, it means a particular place or position. And geographers have come to use it in terms of an idea around this notion of place. So what I've done is I have tied it to one of the key thinkers around this area, which is a guy called James um, Agnew. And what James Agnew did was he defined place as meaningful location. So, it, and we'll run through, he said there were three key elements attached to this. What makes up a place is its location, its locale, and its sense of place. So I've chosen an example to explain those three things to you. So let's think about a notional place which is a university. So here you've got a Lego's kind of picture of, which is a university. Now the first aspect of a meaningful location is what is the location. So he defined location as a set of fixed coordinates. Now most of you would know this generally as longitude and latitude. So where you currently are sitting, that is the address in terms of longitude and latitude. Now he would argue that yes this is helpful if you want to find a place, particularly if for example you're working with digital technologies or you're working on a global scale, but as geographers this wouldn't get us very much information. Okay? What does it, where does this actually get us? It's one aspect, but we need to look beyond just a fixed set of coordinates to understand place as a meaningful location. So not just location, but what are the meanings that underpin the location. So when we start to think about it, he broadened it, and he broadened out his ideas to include something called a locale. Now a locale is what we call a wider material setting. So what's, um, what does he mean by material in this sentence? What he means is, sort of loosely put, it means the real thing, okay? It means the realities that you're in. So one of the examples of that might be the built environment. What are the buildings? What are the roads? What are the places? The actual shape of the place in its concrete form. So this setting, this becomes, university is not just coordinates, it requires buildings and, and a certain kind of practices within these buildings. So what is the shape within it? So the university, for example, it is built currently for a role of 20,000 students. So we have a few issues in terms of space. So many of the things for those of you who are coming to this university, and at any university actually in New Zealand, has space constraints. You will find a lot of your experiences of the university are constrained by space. Where do you study? Where do you find a space? How do you learn? A lot of the way we build our teaching is actually about the built environment and various constraints around it. So a wider material setting could be the built environment, but it also can be things like, can students afford to come to lectures? Um, what other commitments do you have outside of the university? Do you need to work to be here? Are you living away from home? There's a whole bunch of things or systems that may affect um, your uh, location and how you experience it. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Finally, a place is not just about location and locale, it's about the meanings we attach to those places. So people have subjective and emotional attachments to a place. So what you'll find, how many of you are intending to go to a university? I would say that almost everyone who attends scholarship will be. It's, it's generally you're thinking about tertiary education and this is one of the ways that you can get to it. And you're hoping when you go to that university you're going to have that experience. You know, you've heard about these myths, these wonderful things that occur at universities. So part of it will be the learning. You're, here you go. It's, it's, it's a certain a sense of place is created through the experiences that you have in a place. You will be in lectures, you will be in exams, there's no way you will avoid that, it's part of the experience. 
But part of a university experience is not just about what you will learn subject-wise, it is also about the social events. So what you're looking at there are pictures from the 2019 toga party. No, I did not go. My sheets go on my bed. But apparently it was fun, okay? This is what you're looking for. So if we think about university, you're not just imagining coordinates, you're not just imagining the buildings, you're imagining an experience. So for you thinking about location as students, you need to think about location as a meaningful place. Don't just think about it as coordinates. Think about what are the processes that create a place and what meanings are attached to it. You can also, as the last part of a sense of place, have a sense of place and have never been to it. Who's been to New York? Who's never been to New York? Of those who put your hands up who have never been to New York, if you were to close your eyes right now, close your eyes, can you see a picture in your mind of New York? Hands in the air, yes or no? Yes. Okay, that's because a sense of place can be also created through things like shared texts. So shared texts are things in our in our world that we share as a people. They might be books, they might be novels, they might be social media. They become, like I'm pretty sure if you close your eyes, most of you could see the Twin Trade Towers and the planes flying into it. It becomes part of a popular memory, even though it's not our own, okay? So what we think about, it's a sense of place is not just being in a place, it also can be created vicariously through others' experiences or media texts. So have, when you approach location, and teachers amongst you, when you approach location, think of it quite broadly as well. Um, think of it, really challenge yourself to think about the ways in which location is constructed. So the second part of what the scholarship theme has laid down, and I think this is what they're getting at, it, is location tends to be place specific, and it tends to be the local, but they're also recognizing the significance of the global. Because how can the local be relevant when we're increasingly in a globalising world? So what do we mean by a globalising world? Well, it's about understanding increased global integration. Now, I think teachers and students amongst you, this is where you need to look. What is the nature of that integration? Is it social integration? Is it economic integration? Is it cultural integration? Political integration? I think it's all of those things, and potentially that's what you'll frame it around pick case studies around that. And what you'll do is try and link the social to the global. That's what they're looking for. It's not just about, yeah, and I'll get to Amy Judge over here. Stay on track, okay? So it becomes about, climate change might be one of the examples um, where it is about a globalizing world, but there are local ramifications for that. You only have to look at a local example in the wider Oceania. So look at many of those islands in Polynesia, for example, who are suffering the effects of global climate change, but they themselves are having local responses. So it's about the interplay between the two. And there really is a global recognition of this. The most recent Davos conference, and for those of you who don't know what a Davos conference is, I suggest you Google it, um, was actually on globalization and local issues. So it is the topic of the moment. And for those of you who are moving into a ge geographical space, it is really one of the key growth areas in terms of jobs. It is one of those spaces that brings together the local and the global, and that's really what um, employers are looking for. It's skill sets that allow you to travel and bring your knowledge with you. So and one of the ways that we think in terms of a globalizing world will also be about the world is shrinking. So, and what do we mean by that? Many scholars have talked about a shrinking world. So one of the reasons for that is as we gain more and more knowledge and we become more connected, there's a sense of us being um, closer together. So on your right is a very famous diagram by a, a, a geographer called Davis Harvey. And he argued the world itself was shrinking, or what he called time, space, compression. And he argued because of technology, we could move through the world far more quickly. So the world, he argued, in the 1500s to the 1800s meant that your tra average travel speed could get up to 10 miles per hour, which is pretty slow for us today. 
By 1850 to 1930, when we move from those other, uh, other transport modes into things like steam engines, for example, you got to 36 kilometres at that miles per hour. By the 1950s, you get into propeller aircrafts, you get to 400 miles per hour. By the 1960s, you've got jet propeller engines, which get you to 500 to 700 miles per hour. The globe, literally through technologies, and this is just one example of transport, other digital technologies will also increase the, the, um, the connection between areas and the, and the time taken to do things. Another way we tend to think of the world as shrinking is we've got a different perspective of it. Particularly our ability to access space, and what you're looking at here is something called Spaceship Earth. It's not a, a, an actual spaceship, it's a, a very famous NASA picture that came out in the 1960s and the term was coined in the geographical literature called Spaceship Earth which gave us for the first time really a vision of ourselves as a whole planet, as a photograph, because you imagine if you didn't have a sense of really a planetary sense, you started to hear words like one world, okay? So you, of course you're gonna think the world is shrinking if you have a more global perspective. And finally, this term emerged of why we talk more about globalization, this idea that we're globalizing because of something we're now all in a global village, one village, we're all one people. So the key proponent or thinker around that, and on occasion I like to give these pictures um, of the various gentlemen, or, or um, there's one female professor in this lecture, uh, of who comes up with these ideas. Now this is uh, Marshall McLuhan. He wrote in the 1950s and 1960s and argued about a global village where he said we were all one family in a global village. We live in a single constricted space, um, and within that there are some tribalisms, is what he would say, there are some divisions within that vision. So what happened was, people started to say, well, does this mean geography is no longer relevant? Is location no longer relevant because we're globalising? Um, is the world becoming the same? As we're all interconnected, is it the same thing you find in the same place? So for example, a, a scholar called Ralph, and you don't need to know it, it's Ralph, with an, with an E, you don't need to know his name, he came up with an idea called, idea called placelessness. And he said basically it doesn't matter what western city you go to, there's the same ubiquitous landscape. So what does he mean by that? He says in these spaces you'll find the same strip mall with the same shops and the same food. So even though you're in a different location, you're having exactly the same experience you would have in another city. So what did this mean for us as geographers who are really the proponents of the local? So we actually said, well, no, you can't get rid of a local approach because location matters. And this is the wider theme of geography and your scholarship this year. So they argued you needed to focus on location as a response to globalization. Because we were globalizing, okay, yes, we are globalizing, we're becoming more connected, but we live local lives. Money might be moving overseas, goods might be moving overseas, but you're sitting in a lecture hall with me today. Okay, you aren't going anywhere for a good hour or so. So you're very local in this moment. For those who spend at home, I'm just drinking. Geographers were very sceptical of many, because a lot of those ideas that came out in the 60s were very much based around this idea of progress, that we're all gonna come together and everything was gonna be great and we were gonna live in one global village. We're not really in one global village and we'll talk about the builders of the wall soon. We, we hear all the time about dissension and the events in Christchurch, Trump, uh, Crimea, you pick a place and you can find where, why the local is relevant. So they said, well, you need to, yes, the global is important, but the social world is what they call contextual. The local is relevant to that. How does the local affect the way the global is experienced? So they argued there's something called situated knowledge. You can be aware of global processes, but you need to understand the significance of location because there's many different perspectives to economic ideas, to social ideas, to cultural ideas, to climate. You can't have a universal climate policy without a local initiative to enact. And a universal climate policy will not be effective without local voices, okay? 
okay? So you need the interplay of the two. So, uh, so just to even, because often that you'll hear about um, McDonald's being used as an example of that placelessness. Yet even with McDonald's, there are local variations. So this is an example of an Indian McDonald's where you can get a pizza McCuff, I don't know what that is, and you can get an extra spicy McDonald's burger, okay? Uh, it, it's called a McSpicy. So these are the, just even in the, in the product which is supposed to be ubiquitous, there are differences. And there are many different perspectives towards this. Now I don't mean there's many different perspectives towards vaccination, by the way. There's science and then there's the anti-vaccine. <laughs> That's not what I mean here. But what to understand why there are resistances to vaccinations in various places and why there are differences, you can understand that by understanding the local. So an example for you, there has been a measles outbreak in, in New York recently. And this goes back to Mary's point about it's amazing what becomes relevant to your knowledge as a geographer. Just reading various newspapers, um, and I, I can suggest a few at the end if you want the names of some really good ones that can give you a variety of perspectives, will give you insight into what's going on around the world. So back to New York, they had a big outbreak, and they had an outbreak which was quite locally specific, and it turned out it was in a Hasidic Jewish community in New York. And the resistances around being, having their children vaccinated were around a message that had been spread via things like social media, which basically said that the vaccination contained no non-kosher products. It was a lie, but that was the reason why there was this, up, this lack of uptake. Now, if you were just to look at that as a global process, you can't understand why you've got these pockets of, of change. So you need the interplay of both of those things, and geographers are very good at understanding those processes. So how do we understand this? So what I'm going to say is the local matters for three reasons. How do you understand meaningful location? Now I'm going to define these for you, so let's freak out for a moment. Um, Intrican, he basically said, um, Nick Intrican, he said there were three key reasons as to why geographers were interested in place. Empirical, normative, and epistemological. And you go, what? Okay, I promise to give you some examples. So... An empirical significance of place. So globalisation, we just heard about the global, global village, it's homogenising, apparently. Everyone's becoming the same. But are they? How do we account for local differences? When well, Shukin said, you need to understand empirically, you need to do the case study research. So this is where you guys come in, where you might look at the local in terms of your community and neighbourhood. You might think about it as your suburb, your city, your region, your nation, your, or globally. Okay, scale becomes important. It's also about being part of us. So what is your local identity and how does that manifest? So if we think about a cultural identity, so in many ways, for example, hip-hop is quite culturally specific. It, and it originated from the South Bronx in the 1970s in a very, very poor area from two Jamaican dance hall people who brought a Jamaican sound to New York and then it got taken up by African Americans and 10 years later you've got the West Coast sound. So for all of you who think NWA is where um, rap started, it didn't. It's a whole 10 years earlier. For those of you who think, what is she talking about? The origin of hip hop. Okay. So that's quite specific. It came from a particular place yet now it's a global culture. But it has local specificities. I've given you two examples here, which you can look at at your own time, I'm not going to play them, which talk about a South Side identity, Okay, what it is to be a South Aucklander. There's also one that talks about a West Auckland, a West Side identity, and in the remix it actually makes connections to an area on the North Shore. Okay, so if you want to look at two local examples of what is essentially a global, what is essentially a, a music practice that came out of an African American community with Jamaican roots, yet it's become attached to New Zealand identities, particularly Pacifica and Māori identities. Okay, so the local's important and the global's important. I've given you three slides here because I actually grew up on the North Shore. Um, so if you close your eyes and in your mind's eye, if you imagine a shore boy, I guarantee I do this with my first year class, they all pick things like blue-eyed, blonde, um, surfer, skateboarder, and Pākehā. They don't usually say Pākehā, but in blue-eyed and blonde, that's Britain, it's the usual Pākehā. And um, this guy ran for election, for a local election. This is um, in between um, uh, Tokapuna and Milford, and he put the sign up, and I drove past it one day, I thought, what, that's a shore boy? But he was trying to get elected because he was a local. Now, 
Now I parked at um, the Westfield, which is in Takapuna, or what was it, Medic Westfield, and thought, what? So one of the stereotypes, and I will say it, <laughs> is um, of, uh, you guys might know it, so one of the stereotypes that often comes, so that place identity is attached to stereotypes. So one of those might be about the construction of a North Shore girl. And the rhyme goes, Shore girl, anyone gonna take it? There's a whore girl. I heard that one, Shore girl's a whore girl. <laughs> Local, 
it often impedes the way we understand the global. And I'm going to give you an example about this. And what they do within this is they question the universality of how universal is knowledge. So knowledge that often purports to be universal often comes from a particular location. It's often very Western focused, for example. And then they make broad sweeping generalizations about the rest of the world. And it might also be focused around a single gender. So most of the medical research, for example, is done with men. So as a result, many drugs don't work very well on women, and there's examples of deaths due to this because it's been rolled out to all sex-based differences. Uh, another example is of technologies not working because we assume they're going to work because they're objective, but it turns out the data imported was not objective. So I'll give you an example. Just at the moment, Al Jazeera is running a doc two-part documentary on artificial intelligence. And they're talking about face recognition software, which has pretty much been rolled out in globally. It's, it's pretty horrendous in, in many places. In supermarkets, for example, they're about to roll it out Walmart um, just to collect all of your data, your shopping preferences, to store it. I know China, for example, has definitely rolled it out in a number of places. Now, the problem with the data is, uh, the particular software, is the men that created it were, it came, I think it later came from a military application, but also uh, a particular space in, in the Americas, where the faces they imported to create the algorithms were almost all white males. So as a result, if you look at this documentary in Al Jazeera, it, it can't actually recognise the faces of black females. So they're, they're wrongly often identified as criminals because they literally cannot read the face because the data imported, which was assumed to be universal, was flawed because people inputting stuff are always flawed because you're influenced by your local knowledge and who you know. Two examples up here are two different constructions of the world. And some of you may know of these various, this is the Peters projection and the Mercator projection. The Mercator projection is this one here, which was developed in the 1500s. And he basically, um, uh, it was, it's a pretty amazing thing to put a globe into a flat space. But the way he did it was he did it in a way which flattened areas out. And it made certain areas, particularly Europe, look much larger than they actually are. So it wasn't really representative, or it wasn't representative of area. Okay? We were used to looking at this, and the reason, one of the reasons they did this, and I put a link up here to an article talking about how it was about colonialization, and it, it did it in a way to make Europe look much better than it is. Because if you actually look at something, which is a geographer, the Peters um, projection, this is one which is a genuine representation of the size of spaces. And what happens when you get someone else actually doing this to try and what they call decolonize the knowledge, you see Africa and South America becoming much more important as, as spaces in terms of area. But in our mind's eye, look at what happens when Makeda does it. Look how small they are comparatively. Look at how large, because I guarantee when you close your eyes, you don't think of Africa as that large. Okay? And that is literally the impact of um, knowledge and, and, and why place is important. Place is important because it creates the knowledge. Local creates the knowledge and the people creating the knowledge, whose voices are heard and often it's from certain locations. So we as a result as geographers created certain locality um, approaches. So we argue you need to be more realistic in your geography. Can you look at, is there anything particular to a place? Is context important? What are the wider systems going on? What is the significance of local knowledge? How is local knowledge made? And how important is scale? You know, is neighbourhood important? City, um, region, and the like. And just as an example, um, and, and some of you um, may do this in your classrooms, teachers amongst you, many of the theories around location emerged from the geographies of restructuring, <coughs> looking at how, okay? So that's really the origin of it.